Who's excited to be with the guys tonight, amen? Okay, right, welcome to Guys Night Out our way. Hey, and if you're new, you're surrounded with some really, truly, incredibly wonderful guys and some other guys. But those, those first grade guys, they're gonna be super helpful to you. My name's Pastor Mark, one of the pastors here at the church. And the way it works, we do uh, long sermons on the weekend, tend to go through books of the Bible, and then a little application, leadership lesson for men. And we find ourselves in Genesis. And I'm just gonna deal with a couple of scriptures in Genesis chapter two. And here's the big idea. No one has any idea what it means to be a man, why a man is here and what a man is to do and how a young man can become a grown man. Nobody knows. We have the National Organization for Women. There's no National Organization for Men. You can go to college and say, I wanna get a women's studies degree. You're like, oh, do you have a men's studies degree? No, we don't have that. Question is, well, if you wanna learn how to be a man, what a man is, what a man does, where do you go? Here's the good news. The only place open is the church. And, uh, and so we're here to talk about this issue. And what happens in Genesis 2, God is teaching us here about the creation of the heavens and the earth, our first parents, Adam and Eve, the first marriage. And then Moses breaks from a description and depiction of creation. And he comments telling us, here's what a man is, here's what a man does, and here's how a boy becomes a young man, becomes a grown man. And so it's incredibly timely. And we're in this epidemic cultural crisis where young men have no idea what the heck they are doing. And older men do not know how to mentor and raise younger men. And it's a generational catastrophic cultural crisis. And if we could just solve the issue of men, they would solve most of our other problems. And so my answer is always get the men, you win the war, you lose the men, you lose the war. And as we get into it tonight, this section of Genesis is something that Jesus quotes twice in uh, the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Mark, and the Apostle Paul quotes it once. So anytime Moses says it, Jesus says it twice, and Paul says it once, highlight that in your Bible. It's apparently very important. And here's what we're talking about. Uh, the four laws of marriage for men, Genesis 2. Therefore, uh, a man. He's talking about us. He's talking about you guys, men. And he's gonna talk about the uh, four laws of marriage for men. Shall leave his father and mother, uh, that's the law of priority. Hold to, uh, fast to his wife. That is the law of pursuit. Become one flesh. That oneness is part of the law of partnership. And the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. That's the law of purity. And so what I wanna do, I wanna look at these four laws that God establishes in creation. This is before sin enters the world. This is before our planet is cursed. This is for, before everything goes bad. And this is how it was when God declared it all very good. And the first is the law of priority. And that is a man will leave his mother and father. So when you're growing up, and I just wanna to talk to different ages of guys. So how many of you are like college age guys? Late teens, early 20s, you guys, okay? Uh, how about you single guys? You're in your 20s, working your job, trying to figure out you know, what your forward plan is. Maybe you've got a girl, maybe you're hoping for a girl. Uh, maybe you're hoping to get the girl back, you're those guys. How many of you are the married guys? You got a wife and now you're a husband, trying to figure that out. Hey, how many of you you've added to that? Now you're a dad, you've got kids. You're like, okay, I'm trying to figure out how to be a man and a husband and a father. And how many of you are the older guys? You're more in that grandfather position. Your kids are grown and now you've got another generation that is on the horizon and you're helping to invest in. So let's look at each of these laws as it applies to the life stages of men. So the law of priority is you're gonna leave your mother and father. And what this is, this is differentiation and independence. Differentiation is that's my parents and their family. I'm now leaving, becoming an independent grown man, taking responsibility for myself. And now I am differentiating myself from my parents and I'm independent. And the leaving mother and father is physically moving out of the house, financially moving off the payroll. You may or may not go to their church. You may or may not live in their city. You may or may not um, do the things that they want you to do, but you're trying to seek the things that God would have for you to do. Now, if you're in college, the hard thing is, is this law of priority is a half step. Sometimes you're at your parents' house. Sometimes you're on campus. You're working part-time usually, but not full-time. And so the hard part for the law of priority when you're a college guy is, sometimes you're their son and sometimes you're an independent person. Sometimes you're under their roof, sometimes you're under your own roof, but it's a half step in the right direction. For you single guys, uh, this is crucial. And the sooner you can make this pivot 
toward the law of priority that you leave your mother and father, the sooner you can move forward with your life. And what's happening in our culture, and this is a catastrophic failure for young men, we've created a life stage of adolescence where you're old enough to be a man, but we only expect from you the responsibilities of a boy. And a lot of guys are saying, I wanna take my 20s and I wanna extend my childhood as long as I possibly can. And we call this adolescence. So it's, I don't wanna leave my parents' house because then I gotta pay my own rent. And I don't wanna leave my parents' fridge because that means I gotta go buy my own groceries. And I don't wanna leave my parents' insurance because that means I gotta buy my own insurance. And, and, and I don't wanna leave my parents because ultimately they're taking care of me like a little boy and I'd like to extend that as long as I can. Now, the problem is if you don't leave your mother and father soon and you wait longer, then ultimately you have not matured because you've not learned those life lessons of independence and personal responsibility. So what we have now is men are waiting longer than ever to marry in their 30s and they're nowhere near prepared for it. And this is what I told my sons is, the sooner you can get out of my house and off my payroll, the sooner you can start to grow up and be a grown man. Now, you can't just push kids out you know, and hope that they succeed. We're gonna talk about coaching and preparing them. But like what I've told my sons is, man, if you could stay out of credit card debt, college debt, um, and then you could leave my house. And if we could find a way to get you started in the housing market, if you're in your 20s, you are now 10 years ahead of every other guy. Because he's still living with his parents, racking up credit card debt, probably got college debt, not thinking about taking responsibility and nowhere near ready to be a husband and father. And so if you're a young man, you can look at the chaos and folly of the world and come to one of two conclusions. That's what guys do. They waste their 20s with dating, relating and fornicating or that's what those guys do and those are the fools. Therefore, I'm going to launch as quickly as I can because if I can get a 10 year head start on those guys, it just puts me in a strategic position. Think of it like a NASCAR race. Imagine a car in the pits for 10 years. It's really nice to get your car out on the, on the track and get some laps in. And for you guys who are in your 20s, we now have an entire culture that has told you for two years that to be a good man, you should just sit home on the couch, do nothing, plan nothing, don't leave your parents' home and just to wait for the government to send you money. And if you continue that through your 20s, it will destroy your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s and our nation. And so this law of priority is as soon as possible, you leave your mother and father. And once you do that, you're differentiating yourself from your family and you're taking responsibility for yourself. Then you kind of move from that college phase to the single phase. Now you're ready to be married. And once you get married, your priorities are as follow. Your first priority is your relationship with God, first and foremost. He's a father, you're a son. And if you wanna live your life, you need to stay close to your dad. So your relationship with God, second priority, your spouse, your wife. Third priority, kids. Fourth priority, everybody else. Now, before you uh, leave your father and mother, who's your first priority? Well, it's God and then your family. And now their priority role shifts. Maybe before you get married, your priority is your buddies. How many of you got married and all of your friends, all of your buddies, your single guys in their 20s are like, you've changed. You're like, Thanks for the encouragement. You know, it, it, don't say it like it's, an, yeah, I did. I got a job, I got pants, I got a Bible, I got a girl. These are all positives, right? And at the end of the day, sometimes your buddies who are still in that immature adolescence, wasting away their 20s, they look at you and they're like, Hey man, how come you don't hang out with us? How come you don't have time for us? Hey man, you've abandoned us, you betrayed us, you've left us, you've changed. It's like, yeah, I got married and you are no longer my priority. It doesn't mean I hate you. It just means I have time for the Lord, time for my wife, and then maybe extended family, parents, uh, maybe it is former friends or guys you hung out with, but the priorities shift. How many of you young guys, you feel this? Cause all of a sudden you're like, I'm going out with the guys. And your wife is like, oh, no, you're married now. Things are gonna change. So your priorities shift and then you add kids. So you go from kind of college guy, single guy, married guy, dad guy. Okay, so now we're into minivans. And so uh, when you hit this phase uh, and you've got kids, your priorities are God, your wife, and then your kids. 
And that means your extended family, your friends, other relationships, it's not that they're not a priority, but they're not the highest priority. And within this, one of the things that men make as a strategic error in this season is they take their wife and their kid and they put them into a category that they just call family. And then they would say, well, my priorities are God and then my family. And the point is this, you had a family before you had kids. You and your wife are a new family once you get married and then you're adding children to them. The problem is, is if as a man, you just devote yourself to God and family, you're probably not building your marriage. You're probably not investing in your wife. And that is a problem because what holds you together is the kids. And let me say this, for those of you who don't have kids, kids are exhausting and they're expensive. It also says that they're a blessing, but they're a very expensive and exhausting blessing. And sometimes when the kids come, the man puts all of his time and energy into his kids at the expense of his wife. And or what oftentimes happens is the wife puts all of her time and energy where? The kids at the expense of the husband. And all of a sudden the law of priority is violated. So the law of jealousy is triggered. And jealousy is simply this, somebody's in my place and it triggers in a man a sense of injustice. And all of a sudden he was a priority and then the kids came and now the kids are the priority. And so the man starts to get jealous. What happens then is that the wife gets fully focused and devoted to the children and the man gets a little embittered and frustrated. So then he pours all his energy into work. So now for him, work is more important than the marriage. And for her, kids are more important than the marriage. And this is where the pin is pulled on the grenade. And eventually this is all going to explode. And uh, some years ago, I was watching a daytime television show where they, it's kind of an expose and they brought in these women who are mothers, amazing mothers, fully devoted to their children, gave their whole life to their kids. And uh, the host, well, how much, how, how much time do you spend for your kids and how devoted to you are your kids? And what, how much sacrifice? And these, these women were just, well, I do this for my kids and I do that and I do this and I do that and I do this and I do that. And it was just this praise fest for these women. And everybody's clapping and cheering and you're an incredible mom, you're an incredible mom. Now off camera, the women didn't know that their husbands were there. They were in the back room with a different camera on them. And these guys are beet red, smoke coming out of their ears. They're like fire breathing dragons, they're furious. So then they said, okay, we've got your husbands here and we brought them out. The husbands come out and they go, and this is why I hate being married. She gets an A as a mom, she gets an F as a wife. Everything goes to the kids and there's nothing left for our relationship. And what that is, that's an inversion of priority. And a lot of times people say, I don't know why you're so upset. I'm just loving and serving my family. No, 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 no. What are the priorities? God, spouse, kids. And what happens when the law of priority is violated, the law of jealousy is triggered. Hey, that's not right. And what'll happen is, if you architect your family and you don't understand the law of priority, you may stick together while you have kids, but what happens when the kids start to launch? Now we get into that phase of becoming grandfathers. If your family's not well architected and the law of priority is not, um, if it's not adhered to, what happens is as the kids launch, the marriage starts to crater. Why? It was never a priority. We were together to raise these kids, but we weren't together to have a good marriage. So when the kids leave, the one thing that was holding us together is gone. We just took the icing out of the Oreo. There's nothing holding us together and it falls apart. And what oftentimes happens then is, this is where families start to take their generational brokenness and meddle in their children's adult lives. Now don't raise your hand, but how many of you have a, a mother-in-law who are a father-in-law and you're like, you guys are, you're, you're too nosy. You're too overbearing. You're too involved. You're too, like, you have your family. I got my family. Hey, you, you do your thing, let us do our thing. But they can't allow that because the only thing that holds them together is the children. So they can't let the children leave and launch. And or what happens then in a broken dysfunctional family system, if, Let's say Grace and I, we've been married 30 years this year, faithfully married. Our kids are launching. Two are married, one in college, two in high school. So we're, we're, our, our nest is 
kind of half empty actually right now because our college son is in and out. So literally our nest is half empty. In a couple of years, they're all gonna be in college or married or living on their own. So we're, we're closer to an empty nest than we are little kids. And if Grace and I don't have a good marriage and we don't prioritize the relationship with the Lord and each other, then when the kids leave, we have a crisis, we have a catastrophe because the one thing that held us together is gone. So that only allows us two things that we can possibly do. One, let's go, let's keep inserting ourselves and meddling in the kids' lives and, and sort of messing up their families and marriage by intruding. Or two, let's pressure them to have grandchildren because the only way this marriage worked is when we had little people and now they're big, so they need to make some more little people. Does this make sense? So what happens, this is where you get generational brokenness and dysfunction. And it's one generation saying, well, you need to fix our broken family or you need to save our broken marriage. The law of priority says, no, 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 set your priorities as God's divine design would intend and then God will bless them. The next is the law of pursuit. Law of priority is, what are your priorities? Law of pursuit is, where does your time and energy and money go? And it should be according to your what? Your priorities. Your priorities should establish the allocation of your time, energy, and money and what you pursue. When it says that he will hold fast, and some translations will say cleave to his wife, what that means is he's gonna put his energy into his marriage. So to have a good marriage, true or false, it takes a lot of work. Right? Any of you been married for more than 15 minutes and realize this is a whole nother job. Like I work all day and then I come home and to, to have a good marriage takes work. Um, I, I love grace with all my heart, but I'll just tell you this, marriage is work, especially work for grace. I mean, look what she's got to put up with, but it's just a lot of work. And so the point is this, if God and your spouse and your kids are your priority, then your passionate pursuit of energy has to be toward your priorities. But what happens is other people and things, they try to take your time, energy, and money, and they try to reorient your priorities. And this can be your extended family. And they're making demands. And they're not understanding that when you get married, you start your own family. And I said this on the weekend, but let me just stress this. Um, when my kids got married and I officiated both of my older children's wedding, it was an honor. Um, and if my son is here, thank you son for that honor. But what I told them was, hey, our kids are not joining that family and those kids are not joining our family. These kids are getting married and guess what they're doing? They're starting a new family. And now we are extended family. So they get to decide where they live, where they go to church, what they do for Christmas, what they do for Thanksgiving. How many of you, some of the most exhausting times in your, in your marriage and family are around the holidays with extended family? And they're like, well, here's what you're gonna do. And you're like, whoa, you're not part of my family. You have your family, I have my family, we are extended family. You can't tell me what to do. We can have a discussion and maybe we come to some mutual agreement, but I'm not joining your family. I'm starting my family. And I, I tell the, the sons this, or the son-in-laws, like you're the head of your family, I'm the head of my family. And now there's three families. And eventually when all five kids get married and Grace and I, there'll be six families. And if we wanna do things together, we need to talk about that. And I can't just impose myself or tell you what to do. We gotta talk and pray and figure this out. And what happens is if this is not understood, then your dysfunctional broken family you're married and it says that a man should pursue his wife, right? With passion, his time and energy and focus is the marriage. But the family's like, no, no, no. What about us? What about us? What about us? What about us? It's like, you're now extended family because I have what? My mother and father. I've left my mother and father. And then the parents will make you feel real guilty. Like you've abandoned us. No, I obey Genesis 2 and Jesus Christ and Paul. And I was raised in a family and then launched to have my own family. And what happens then is with the law of pursuit, you can waste a lot of your time, energy, and money that should be devoted to your relationship with God and your spouse. So for you college guys, here's what you need to do. You need to understand if you're a college guy right now, your time, your energy, your money, your passionate pursuit has to be preparing yourself to become a, a Christian husband and father. If those are your priorities, is relationship with God, wife and kids, then your goal should be to prepare yourself to be a Christian husband and father. And all of your time and energy should be devoted toward that. If you are a guy who is single, 
what are you looking for? If you are a single guy, what are you looking for? A wife. I don't know why it's quiet. This is not a secret. Like, uh, you know, you're, are, are you looking for a girlfriend? No, you're looking for a wife. Because th- the whole goal is leave your mother and father, cleave to your wife, the two become one flesh, naked and unashamed. The end zone is marriage, which is two things. It's consummation of a covenant. It's a covenant that is consummated. So if you're a single guy, let me tell you this. You should not be wasting your time and energy on tons of hobbies. You, shouldn't, you should have buddies and friends and make memories and enjoy your life, that's fine. But your time, energy, and money should not be just wasted on all of your hobbies and friends and dating and relating and fornicating, but invested in becoming a Christian man who's ready to be a husband and father and actively looking for a wife. And what oftentimes happens when a guy is single is that he, he has a list of what he's looking for in a woman. And I would say, if you're gonna do that, then on the backside of that sheet of paper, write a list of all the things that you wanna be for that woman. Don't just make a list of what you're looking for, make a list of who you're looking to become for her. And if you're a single guy, you need to know this, the entire world that we live in is intended to cause you to be unhealthy and dysfunctional and to break your family for generations. In the 20s, the whole goal is, uh, hey, watch, watch a lot of porn, drink a lot of alcohol, make a lot of bad mistakes and date and sleep with and maybe move in with as many women as possible. Question, does that prepare you to be a good Christian? No, does that prepare you to be a good husband? No, does that prepare you to be a good father? No, because now you are acting completely selfishly. And to be a good Christian husband and father, you've gotta be a servant. You need to be a producer, not just a consumer. You need to be a giver, not just a taker. And so if you're a single guy, first of all, it's, am I a good Christian? And if not, I gotta get right with Jesus and I gotta get some stuff straightened out. Then have I left my mother and father? Am I independent, differentiated, responsible? If so, now I'm ready to figure out who my wife is and take my energy to pursue her her to build this relationship of marriage with her. And so for you guys who are single, um, let me give you the process. It starts with friendship with a woman, okay? The whole goal is to start with friendship, meaning, She is your sister in Christ. Um, She's gonna be somebody's wife. And if she's not gonna be your wife, treat her in such a way that you're not hurting her before she gets to her husband. And so it starts as a friendship and then it becomes intentional dating. And intentional dating is different than casual dating. Casual dating, how many people do you date at a time? However many you want. Intentional dating, just one. Casual dating, is there any end zone or goal or objective to the dating? No, we're just hanging out. We're just living together. We're just sleeping here. What are you guys doing? I don't know. We'll just see what happens. We'll take it as it comes. Intentional dating is, no, I'm getting to know you to see if you could potentially be my wife. And if at any point you're not going to be my wife, we we still have our friendship, but because the relationship is intentional, the intent is to get married. And if that is not what is going to happen, then I'm not going to continue to spend intimate time with you. We're not gonna have any physical involvement. That would be wrong. Now, let's say you meet a gal, you're friends with her. I like her, she likes me. We get along good, get to know her, get to know our friends and family. Hey, declare intent. I'm interested in you. I find you interesting. I'd like to intentionally date you and get to know you better. Well, what are your intentions? Answer? My goal is not to be single. That's my end zone, okay? Just let you know what my my goal is. I would like to be married. Now, I don't know if you're gonna be my wife, but I'm willing to find out. Now, if that intentional dating process goes well, you love the Lord, you love each other, you get to know her friends and family, you're like, okay, this this has got potential here. I got a draft pick on the board. You know, I I I got a first round draft pick on the board. Then what you do, you sign up for, um, you, you seek wise counsel, find good godly people who love the Lord and have a good marriage. Say, hey, why don't you guys get to know us and tell us what you think? We've never been married. Seems like a good idea to us, but we don't know. Could you help us give wise counsel? And hopefully your family is godly and can help in that. Then if you say, oh, you know what? This is going pretty good. Then sign up for a premarital class. We've got one here. 
Say, hey, let's go, let's go through a process and a class and meet with mentors and see what the Bible says and, and let's let them help us figure out if we're ready. And if in that process, you come to the, the people that are godly, they look at you, they're like, you guys are a good fit. I think you guys are gonna do good. Then the, husband, the, the man has to decide what? Do I wanna propose or not? And if he proposes, she says, yes, now you're engaged. Now you set a date, then you get married. She becomes your wife. You have a, co- you have a covenant that gets consummated. And your goal as a guy who's single, especially in his 20s is what? That's the process. The goal is not, I'm looking for a hot chick. Uh, she's hot, so's hell. I, I'm saying <laughs> avoid both. That's what I'm saying. You're like, well, you know, she's really good in bed. Like, I'm not looking for a good time. I'm looking for a good legacy. Well, you know, I don't think I'm ready to be in a serious relationship. Well, then don't be in any relationship. Okay, and, and it's intentional. But what I'm telling you is this, again, guys don't think this way and they're wasting some of the best years of their life that they could be investing them. So if you are a married man, It is raising your sons to become grown men. Raising your daughters to be loved, protected and cherished and modeling for them marriage is a gift from God and a covenant and a blessing. And if you get to the point where your kids are getting a little older, what happens for dads and grandpas is we reach a point in our life that we leave the field, we go to the sidelines and we become the coach. And uh, when I was, uh, well, when I was little, my dad coached my baseball teams. And, um, and one of the things that happened when, when you're really little, let's say it's T-ball and little guys, where, where is the coach? He's on the field. He's like, okay, you stand here. This is, you know, where second baseman plays and you stand here. And then he's, okay, you, you know, here, here's the T, here's the, here's the bat. Here. Cause every kid comes up and they center themselves on the T and they hold the bat like this. You're like, that's, that's a good way to murder someone, but not to get an on-base percentage. So you, you, what you do is when you're coaching little kids, the coach is usually the dad and the coach and the dad usually gets on the field to teach the kids. Now, as the kids get older, if you're the dad and the coach, you're allowed on the field. If you go to a high school game, okay? Let's say there's a guy up to bat and his dad comes out. He's like, no, just wait a minute. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> It's a weird day because it's like, no, no, dad, you could be on the field when he was little, but as he gets bigger, you gotta leave the field and he's gotta figure out how to play his position. Now, what you can do is you can coach from the sidelines. And there's a point in life as you're raising your children, especially your sons to become men, you're preparing them to leave their mother and father. And at some point you gotta get off the field and say, okay, son, I'm here. I'm here to coach, but this is your life. These are your decisions. Like you, you gotta figure out God's will for your life. Like, and I'm, I'm here to coach you, but you gotta, you gotta live your life. Now question, is this usually hard for mom to do? Sometimes you're like, you go like, honey, I love you. Here, we gotta leave the field, sweetheart. You know, we gotta, because oftentimes mom gets so used to mothering her little boy that she's smothering her big boy. And so part of dad's job as the kids get older is to become the coach, let them live their life and make their decisions. And then also coach mom, honey, our goal with our son is that he will leave his his mother and father. Like I'm willing to let him go. You gotta be willing to let him go, make some decisions. That's the law of pursuit. Because until he leaves his mother and father, and he's growing up and taking responsibility, he's not shifted his energy and attention toward being ready for a wife. So the law of priority is his priority shift. The law of pursuit is his energy goes toward preparing himself to be a husband and a father. And then the law of partnership, it says that the two shall be one flesh. And I told you this weekend, that little word in Hebrew, not to nerd out, is the same word that's used of God in Deuteronomy 6, 4, that hear us for the Lord our God is one. And so the goal is this, you're connected to your family and then you leave your mother and father and your parents go into the position of coach. Now you take the field of your own life. You figure out what position God has for you to play, what you're supposed to do. You take your time and your energy 
to focus on being a good Christian so you can become a good husband, so you can become a good father. And the goal is to be one with your wife. And what that means is your priority can't be your family, can't be your hobby, can't be your friends, needs to be your God, needs to be your bride. And the two of you becoming one, it is emotional connection, physical connection, financial connection. It is practical life together. If you don't pursue oneness, what you will end up with is a marriage where it is literally two people who are living independent lives. He's got his bank account, she's got her bank accounts. He's got his schedule, she's got her schedule. He's got his friends, she's got her friends. He's got his church, she's got her church, if they go to church. Um, she's got her you know, holiday and vacation, he's got his holiday and vacation. Any couple that tries to do this, here's what happens. You know what happens? This. This is what happens. Eventually the drift is toward division and separation. And Jesus says, a house divided what? Falls down. So God says, be one. And Jesus says, if you have two, you're gonna have pain. And so it's a man saying, okay, how do we be one? How do we stay literally on the same page? How do we worship one God? How do we live in one house? How do we have one schedule? You know, how, how do we attend one church? You know, how, how do we live one life and become one? And, and it's his energy and his time and his effort. Because again, the law of priority, that's what God requires of him. Law of pursuit, that's where he's supposed to put his time and energy. So let me say this. If you're a single guy or you're a, or you're a college guy, here's what you need to know. You're selfish. And you're not thinking about becoming one. You're looking forward to an attractive woman taking care of you, which is similar to the relationship that you had with your mother. You were selfish and she would tend to you. And what we're getting right now with a lot of marriages with young men, they are immature and they attract overly responsible young women. And they end up with a relationship that looks more like a big sister and a little brother or a mother and a son than it does a husband and a wife. She's responsible, he's not. She's got a job, he doesn't. She's got a house, he doesn't. She's got goals and ambitions, he doesn't. She's pursuing a degree, he isn't. And the result is then you sort of fall in, you're like, well, we, we, we slept together and then I moved in with her and we were together so long that eventually somehow we just decided to get married. Okay, God's not gonna bless that. That's not his intended order. In addition, that's not oneness. That's messiness. That's not intentionally architecting life. It's just haphazardly living life. And so when you become a father, the goal is to model for your kids Healthy Christian, healthy husband, healthy father, modeling for the kids, being one with mom, loyal to her, devoted to her, doing life with her. And let me say this, not just working around her, but finding a way to heal whatever is broken in her and then lovingly lead her. And a lot of times guys are like, what you're saying is I've got to work with my wife. No, why? I don't, it just, it's too much. Well, then something there is broken that needs to get healed. Something there is amiss that needs to get solved and resolved. And if you're saying, well, no, no, I just can't work with her, so I work around her, guess what? You have a broken dysfunctional family. And eventually your marriage is going to do this and your wife is going to either have an inability to let the children grow up or she is gonna demand grandchildren and she's gonna wanna repeat the broken cycle generationally. And many of you feel that pain in your family because the generation before you, they let it happen. And you're frustrated, you're like, why didn't you deal with your marriage? Why didn't you figure your stuff out? Why didn't you guys get a plan? Why didn't you put things, you, you guys are causing us a lot of pain. And then we hit our family and we say, you know what? I don't wanna deal with it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hand the pain off to the next generation. Okay, true or false, this is what we do. Well, this is very painful. So you, you kids can have it. You grandkids can have it. And that's how generational brokenness becomes generational curse. So then the last one is the law of purity. Naked without shame. Now, this is the one of all of the four laws. This is the one you like the most. Everybody's like, I just, just go to point four. The point is this. 
you can't enjoy point four unless you do points one, two, and three. Like, let's say right now you need to go somewhere tonight and you put in your phone like, okay, I wanna get here. Turn left, turn right, turn left, arrive at your destination. I don't wanna turn right, I wanna turn left. I just wanna arrive at my destination. The answer is, if you don't turn right, you don't turn left, you wanna arrive at your destination. Most guys are like, I like that naked part. I like that. I'm pro, pro naked, I give or take shame, but naked for sure, I'm 100% in. And most guys are like, I just want, I want a woman who's naked and available. True? I know we're live streaming this. We we'll probably just got kicked off of Facebook, but. Um, so the answer is, okay, step one is what? Leave your mother and father. Grow up, become a man, figure out who you are, what God has for you to do. Step two, go from law, a priority to law of pursuit. I'm gonna pursue my priorities. Relationship with the Lord, I'm looking for a wife, not just a good time not just a good weekend, a good woman to live a good life and to leave a good legacy. And the point is this, I'm not just looking for a woman who's gonna be fun on Friday night, but she's gonna be faithful in 50 years. I'm looking for a woman that I want my daughters to be like her and I want my sons to marry someone like her so that all the effort and energy we put in is carried forth generationally. Then, is the law of pursuit. He's like, okay, I'm gonna put my time and energy into this woman. And then the law of partnership. Okay, honey, we're gonna forgive sin. We're gonna apologize. We're gonna come under God's authority. We're gonna try to do what God says. We're gonna try to be one. Then guess what? She feels that you're safe and trustworthy. Because ultimately this, men wanna touch their wife's body, but before you do, you need to touch her soul until she knows that you love the Lord and you love her and that you're committed to her, that you're devoted to her, that she can depend on you. She doesn't feel safe and intimate with you. So a lot of times guys are like, I wish the sex was better. And God's like, okay, well, I've got an answer for that. Step one, step two, step three, step four. But if you're going to disobey these three steps, why would I give you exactly what you want with my daughter, but because before she is our wife, she is his daughter. And so ultimately we live in this world where everything like a gravitational force is fighting against God's intention to raise men. We've actually inverted this whole process. Where do we start? Uh, hey, let's get naked. And if I can't get someone to get naked, I will just go online and I will find people that are naked. That's a shortcut. Find naked um, and then maybe at some point after I've slept with enough women or looked at enough women, uh, maybe I choose one to kind of be sort of exclusive with or kind of have some sort of cohabitation, dating, relating and fornicating relationship. But we're certainly not gonna move up to the place where um, I'm gonna pursue them and give my whole life to them because to be sure they're not a priority to me. And the reason that we don't have men is we don't obey God's process. The reason that we don't have healthy marriage, we don't obey God's process. The reason that we don't have healthy generational family legacy, we don't obey God's process. So let me tell you a couple things on, uh, for college men, you're gonna need to learn some self-control sexually. For you single guys, let me say this. Um, this is, let me just put the dad hat on for the single guys. A lot of guys are like, well, what's the big deal if I sleep with her? Well, the big deal is as soon as you sleep with her, you can no longer lead her. You have lost all of your moral authority. You know this is a single guy. As soon as you start sleeping with her, you can't be like, honey, you know, the Bible says, she's like, what are you talking about? You don't have pants on. You can't quote verses to me. <laughs> All of a sudden, what you've just told her is, I'm going to rebel against God. And then what's she going to do? She's gonna join you in rebelling against God. And a lot of guys are like, I don't know why my, my girl won't let me lead. And the issue is if you're sinning with her, you've lost the moral authority to lead her. She doesn't respect you because now she is manipulating and controlling you through sex. And so if you are a single guy, what's at stake here is not just having a good time, but actually being a decent man and, and living a decent life. And you, you can be like Esau. You remember the story of Esau in Genesis? This is where I just sort of free flow. He came home one day and he traded his birthright for what? 
a bowl of soup. There's a lot of guys. And, and what that is, is he's like, you know what? In this instance, what matters to me most is a little bit of pleasure. So I'll just trade my birthright for soup. And the question is, what are you willing to trade your birthright for? What are you willing to trade your blessing for? And it may feel good in the moment, but ultimately it, it's a complete loss. And, and let me say this as well, when it comes to naked without shame, at this point, um, there's one man, there's one woman. And so who is the standard of beauty? It's the spouse. God doesn't give Adam or Eve a standard of beauty. He gives them a spouse as their standard of beauty. For Adam, there's one woman. Guess what? <laughs> That's the woman. Paul says in the New Testament that men should be one woman men. For Adam, he literally was a one woman man. He's like, I know what that's like. I only hear there's only one woman. And so what that means is when you meet your wife and you consummate your covenant, she's your standard of beauty. Now, what this means is anybody else you meet, that's not your standard of beauty. In addition, as she gets older, she is your standard of beauty at that age. So if you meet her at 20, and you're married for 50 years, which is awesome, your standard of beauty is a 70 year old woman. And ultimately what everything in our culture mitigates against is this kind of thinking and living and it leads to tremendous brokenness. Um, I, I, I always just kind of verbal process, I'll close with this. Um, I was telling, uh, one of the guys on staff beforehand. I was 17 years of age, maybe 16. I was working as a longshoreman, uh, throwing 100 pound sacks of peas in, uh, in a railroad car that was taken off a container ship. And I lied about my age, falsified my birth certificate, and I'm throwing 100 pound sacks of peas and then drive the bull and take the forklift and go make deliveries for distribution. And I'm in the, uh, I'm in the railroad container and uh, there's a guy in there with me, he's in his 40s. I didn't know Jesus and I didn't really know him. And I said, hey, what do you got going on this week? And he's like, oh, it's gonna be a great weekend. He's like, it's, it's, it is gonna be a great weekend. I was like, what's that? He said, uh, well, my daughter, she's hot. Okay, he's like, yeah, my daughter's really hot. I'm like, what the? And he said, her friends are really hot too. He said, she's having a slumber party. They're all coming over. I can't wait to see them in their pajamas. I'm just gonna sit in my chair and drink beer and watch them. It's gonna be a great week, weekend. I just remember just going, I didn't know Jesus. And honestly, I didn't know anything. I just remember being in that moment thinking, how do I not be this guy? <laughs> like, I don't know what to do, but I'm pretty sure what not to do. And what he had done, he had violated everything that God said, father's heart, husband of one wife, everything God had said. And all of a sudden he just went to step four and that is just naked. I just want naked. And he was so obsessed with a certain age that wasn't his wife, that as soon as his daughter hit that age, she was his fantasy. The whole world is completely broken. Men are poisoned. Their souls are traumatized. Their lives are shipwrecked. And all we gotta do is say, you know what? I repent, I was wrong. I wanna have a new authority. I wanna have new desires. I wanna be the new link in the chain. I want things to be different for me, my wife, my kids. And even if I've made a lot of mistakes, I'm gonna start by being honest and owning it and apologizing for it and repenting and asking God to help and finding good men to bring around me who are like, okay, everybody out there has lost their mind. And in here, we wanna be renewed and transformed in our mind. And so how do we think differently? How do we architect differently? Um, this didn't end up where I intended it to, but let me just say this. A lot of the pain that you have endured was because of choices that were made before you were born. And a lot of the pain 
that will be endured by others will be caused by the choices that you are making. And as men, we have this tremendous opportunity as heads of household to set in motion new legacies of blessing, not cursing, life, not death, marriage, not just sex, right? Fathering, not just siring. And that's why we're here. This is the most important hour of your week because the decisions you make here determine everything else that happens in your week. Father, I, I know that the room is heavy and the spirit in the room is heavy, but God, the law of priority is real. Some of us need to leave our father and mother. The law of pursuit is real. Some of us need to passionately, lovingly, humbly pursue our wives. The law of partnership is real. We can't just live separate from our wife. We can't just work around her or ignore her or just sort of pretend that she doesn't exist or have problems. We need to figure out a way to help her get healing if she is broken and to become one with her. And God, the law of purity is true. Most men wanna be naked and you want your men to be naked without shame. Sex is a blessing and it's a gift. But outside of marriage, it is a dangerous and devastating opportunity to literally just unleash the flames of hell all over our family. And God, I, I don't wanna be harsh. I don't wanna be mean. I don't wanna be cruel. I, I wanna be sober and I wanna be helpful. And God, I just, I thank you that you don't just save us from Satan, sin, death, and hell. You save us from ourselves. And God, I pray for the young men and I wanna honor the, the college guys and the single guys. God, they could be anywhere and they're here. And what they're gonna hear in our midst is completely different. But God, we want them to grow up and be good Christians and be good husbands and be good fathers. And for that to happen, Lord, uh, they're gonna need a lot of grace. And God, we've all blown it, we've all failed. There's not a man here who doesn't consider these things and say, uh, I'm a man of unclean lips and I come from a people of unclean lips. I have said and done things that I regret. And so God, we thank you for the Lord Jesus who is perfect and died that we might live and rises, that we might bring our lives up from the death that we have brought into our own life. But God, I just feel particularly burdened for lives and legacies. And God, I pray for my kids and their kids and their kids' kids. And I pray, God, that as much as possible, we would bless the future and not curse it. And God, that these men would take the, the laws that you give and that they would live by them so that you could bless them. And God, for the men who wanna make excuses, I pray instead they would make plans. For the men who wanna shift the blame, I pray that they would take the responsibility. And God, for the men who never wanna come back because this seems like a hard word, I pray they would come back because they would know that it comes from a soft heart. And thanks for an opportunity to just ramble a bit in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you guys.